Today I'm going to finish the general frameworks of statistical mechanics um, by showing you how you construct the probability in any general ensemble. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about fluctuation theory. Um, and uh, after that, um, we'll essentially come up a bunch of special cases, examples, independent systems, um, vibrations in materials, configurational disorder. Uh, and for that, we're going to have a few guest lectures by uh, Dr. Chris Bartel. So he's going to take over from me for a couple lectures, uh, actually for three on uh, Monday. Uh, and remember, on Friday, you have a discussion. Um, OK, so let me um, give you the general ensemble um, or general probability uh, derivation, although it's not a complete derivation, really. Um, so the question I'm really going to try to answer is, when you have a general ensemble, uh, how do you write the probability, right? The probability is proportional to the exponential of something. And the question is, what is this something, right? What's in this, or what's often called the Hamiltonian of the statistical mechanics, uh, what goes in there? Because as we've already seen in the grand canonical ensemble, it's not just the energy that appears here. It's not just the classic Boltzmann factor. Uh, that appears in there. Uh, I'm going to detour a bit uh, to do that um, by reminding you of uh, a little bit of classical thermodynamics with it um, using the entropy formalism. So in thermodynamics, we tend to write everything in terms of energy, right? So we start from a differential of the internal energy, uh, which is the first law. And then from that, we take Legendre transforms. Uh, in statistical mechanics, uh, it's actually much more convenient to start from the entropy differential and take Legendre transforms of the entropy differential. And, and why is that? Um, uh, it's really because while in classical thermodynamics you track energy, in statistical mechanics you care about the probability distribution. And the probability distribution, um, as we've said, is completely controlled by the entropy. And so you, what you're going to see is, whereas the energy is the natural coordinate in classical thermodynamics, um, the entropy is the, the really natural function to work with in statistical mechanics. So, so let me sort of maybe make a big table and line up what the relevant equations are, either working in an energy formalism or in an entropy formalism. So in the energy formalism, right, the energy is a function of the entropy and the extensive variables, if you remember. Well, in the entropy, you just substitute that and the entropy is a function of the internal energy and the extensive variables. Uh, and this is what's referred to in general as the characteristic equation. The key differential, which in thermodynamics is the first law, is that the way you change internal energy is by the heat flow in TDS plus whatever work terms you have, yi dxi. Right? And you can think of this as the, the, the important differential. In the entropy formalism, I can just rewrite that differential by figuring out by putting the S on one side. And what you see now is that the entropy change of a system is controlled by the internal energy change weighted by T minus some I Y I over T the XI. You know, and besides math, I wish you, I hope you can start to sort of see why it has this form, right? If you look carefully at this, forget about the division by T, right, for a second. But what this is really telling you is the energy is increased by all the energy you put in, but not the work. And that's really what you're seeing here, right? So it's essentially all the heat that's coming in, right? Because the U is all the energy increase. And what you're taking out is the work. 
And that's what controls the entropy. And of course, as we'll see or have seen, that's what controls the probability distribution. So the conjugate pairs in the entropy formalism are things like TS and YI XI. Whereas the conjugate pairs in the entropy formalism are one over T and energy and minus yi over t, so the forces weighted by t and the extensive variables. So these are the conjugate pairs. So here they have dimension of energy, here they have dimension of entropy. And later, well, in a few minutes, what I'm going to do is normalize the entropy by the Boltzmann constant, and we'll actually then end up with conjugate uh, variables that whose product is dimensionless. And so then if you do equilibria in different environments, so remember right here, you would normally minimize U under constant entropy, but we also show that that's the same as maximizing S under constant energy. So if you work under different boundary conditions, you can do Legendre transforms. So here you would, if you work in different boundary conditions, you would define some potential, let's say of the uh, entropy, a bunch of yi's and a bunch of uh, xj's. So the yi's are the ones where you've gone to control of the intensive variable instead of the extensive variable. And again, that's defined as u minus uh, yi xi. Right, and I write this here as, as one conjugate couple, but you could Legendre transform uh, with respect to as many as you want. And typically this is a function that you minimize. Similarly, you can take a Legendre transform of the entropy. So I could define some function Psi, function of the energy and now uh, um, for consistency, I'll call it Yi xj where the j's are not equal to y and that would be the entropy minus the conjugate pair here but since there's a minus sign here this becomes plus yi over t xi and the entropy or the Legendre transform of the entropy would be maximized in equilibrium so these are mathematically cons completely consistent um, equations, right? Uh, as you can easily show, but we're going to use this formula in statistic mechanics just because it's a lot handier. Tell me if I need to go back to a part of the board, right? Um, I'm going to redefine some variables because in statistical mechanics, we're always going to have these intensive quantities divided by T. Um, so I'm going to uh, redefine a few things. Um, and of course, the first one we already know, right? Beta is defined as one over KBT. But I'm also now going to redefine now these intensive variables divide, divided by T. I'm going to call these xi. So xi i is minus y i over k b t or minus beta times y i. And then we don't have to carry the, the t around all the time. So when you do this, the conjugate variables become beta and u uh, and xi i and xi, and these couples are now, uh, their product is dimensionless. And you can rewrite the differential of the entropy in units of KB, so normalized by KB, as beta du plus sum i xi i dxi. Uh, and let's pause here for a second. And I'm trying, yep. 
Um, so you should almost think of this as the equivalent differential for the entropy that the first law differential was when we did classical thermodynamics, right? So first of all, um, um, we write the entropy in units of KB. Remember KB is the same units as entropy. So this is not dimensionless. And actually sometimes we'll just drop the KB and sometimes I'll call this S prime when it's in units of KB. But again, it doesn't really matter that much. KB is just a constant, it's just that in the end, make sure your units work out. Uh, and, and the terms on the right here are essentially now the natural differentials that modify the entropy, right? There's um, the energy input, but what you subtract from it is the work that actually, so the part of the energy that came in as work does not modify the entropy. And this jives with what we saw last time, right? That uh, if you look at how you can change the energy of a system, you can either change it by changing the probabilities across states, right? That's the heat term. Or you can uh, change the energy by changing the energy levels, and that's the work term, OK? So this is probably what you should remember for now. So let me do a few examples. It, so you get familiar with this notation. So let's do a canonical system, canonical ensemble. Right, so normally I would write that as T, V, N as applied variables, but if I go to um, the redefined variables, I would write that as constant beta V, N, N. Right, same thing, right? So what would be the relevant Legendre transform of the entropy, right? So I work with this intensive variable or beta and not its conjugate uh, extensive, which would be U. So I have to Legendre transform with respect to that pair. So the relevant uh, Legendre transform of the entropy would be phi would be as a function of beta V and psi as a function of beta V and N would be the Legendre transform of the entropy as S prime minus beta E. And I've written S prime here as S over KB, right? And remember that E average and U is all the same thing, right? And the way I've written it here, psi is also now in dimensionless units, right? Because I've written S prime here, which is S over KB and beta times the energy has no dimension either, right? So I would have to maximize this because it's a Legendre transform of the entropy. And I hope you can easily see that that's the same as minimizing the Helmholtz free energy, right? This is mine, this term here is up to a constant is minus the Helmholtz free energy. So if I maximize this term, it's the same as minimizing the Helmholtz free energy, right? So this is equivalent to minimizing Let's do a grand canonical ensemble. So that would be TV mu as control variables. Or if I go to my new variables, that would be beta, V, and psi, where I've defined psi as minus beta times mu. Okay, so what would now be the relevant Legendre transform of the entropy? I'm gonna call it Psi. It's not the same Psi as here, but after a while I call everything Psi because I run out of Greek letters, right? So the, the entropy potential Psi would, as a function of beta V and Psi is now Legendre transform of the entropy. 
with respect to two conjugate pairs, because I work in two intensive variables, one beta, one psi, so minus beta average energy minus uh, psi times n, where n is the, the conjugate variable to mu, right, the number of particles in the system. And you would maximize this. If you want to sort of bring this back to things you know, right, things that you're more familiar with, you could sort of substituting in what beta means, what psi means, right? And this would be up to, uh, if, you, if you multiply by KB, this would be, and KB is positive, so I can do that, right? This would be S minus E over T plus mu over T times N. And I would maximize that, which again, try to convince, let me stay down so you can read this. Try to convince yourself that this is the same as minimizing what we call the grand potential, right? The Legendre transform of the energy with respect to Ts and mu n. So, I want to show you something that when we did the probability density in the canonical ensemble, so in the canonical ensemble, right, the probability of a microstate is proportional to the exponential of minus beta times the energy of the state, which if you notice, that's exactly this piece. In the grand canonical ensemble, the probability was proportional to the exponential of minus beta E um, plus, sorry, minus beta E minus um, mu N. And if you look carefully, that's exactly this piece. And I'm going to generalize this, but I want you to sort of think a bit about this because it's actually starts, if you think about it, it's really hard. It actually makes an awful lot of sense, right? The things that control the probability distribution is the Legendre transform of the entropy part, right? Because you're now maximizing the entropy of the system and the environment together. Just like when I showed you what thermodynamic potentials are, I told you as soon as we have open systems, we're not really minimizing the energy of the system anymore. We're minimizing some property of the system plus the environment. So, how will the general ensemble look like? Okay, so you have fluctuating variables that the fluctuating variables are energy, right? So you're working at constant temperature or controlled temperature and some set of extensive variables, right? So there's some set of extensive variables which are not constant. So remember that the things that can vary in the ensemble. These are the things that you need to Legendre transform with respect to, right? Because they are under control of their conjugate intensive variable. So in the entropy notation, if we were to write the relevant entropy potential for, for this system, it would be the Legendre transform 
of the entropy, and I'm not going to write it out explicitly now as normalized by KB, minus beta E minus psi J XJ, right? So this, this is the relevant thermodynamic potential to be maximized. So let me not convince you a little more that this Legendre transform part is actually what appears in the probability density. I'm gonna do that on the other board, but I'll leave this up and then we can come back to this. And I hope that by now you've had a chance to go through the derivation of the canonical ensemble and maybe even the grand canonical ensemble so that you sort of understand what the critical steps are and how each piece in the probability density uh, appears. So if I work on the fluctuating variables E and XJ, right? So these are the, the, the extensive variables that can change. that fluctuate in the ensemble. Then remember that when I do the derivation of the ensemble, remember I, I, maximize, uh, I, I maximize the distribution, which I call the, uh, A bar, but I will have a series of constraints on, on the maximization. So the constraints, again, the first one is always the trivial one, right? That the sum of all the occupancy variables is the total number of systems in the larger microcanonical ensemble that contains all my replicas. I will have a constraint on every fluctuating variable. So I will have a constraint on the energy. So sum nu times the occupancy times E nu will be E total. And then if I have other extensive variables, I will have a constraint on these as well. So some new, a new, and now we're getting a lot of indices here. So it's going to be xj and the j indicates which extensive variable it is, but it has to be defined for microstate new, right? So XJ is because it's, we're using a general label here for any extensive variable. So I pick out the J one, and then this is evaluated in microstate nu. So this has to be XJ total in the larger ensemble, right? And do you remember what these lead to? This one, this, this Lagrange multiplier, this one just leads to the normalization. Right? This essentially leads to the partition function in your probability. This one leads to a term in the probability. This, this is telling you that the probability has to be proportional to the exponential of minus beta E nu. And this one, then will by analogy tell you that the proportion that the probability has to be proportional to the exponential of minus um, psi j nu sorry psi j x j nu. I hope that this at least make some level of sense to you by now, right? That you have fluctuating variables that leads to Lagrange multipliers, that leads to constraints. When you include them into the uh, optimization as Lagrange multipliers, they bring a piece into the probability. The part that 
we've only proven once in, when we did the canonical ensemble is that these Lagrange multipliers, beta and in this case, psi, that they would be related to thermodynamic quantities, right? So that I haven't actually explicitly proven to you uh, for the other cases. But my guess is that you don't really want me to do that proof again. Um, so if you put this all together, what this means is that the probability has to be proportional to these things. So it's going to be the exponential of minus beta e nu minus psi j x j nu divided by the partition function. And so what you see, what appears in the Hamiltonian in the exponential is exactly the Legendre transform of the entropy. So if you ever are in doubt and you want to figure out how do you construct you know, a probability density, and people get very confused, right? Oh, is it just the energy or is it minus mu n or is it plus mu n? And, and what do I do with volume and the volume fluctuates? If you systematically work through the entropy formalism, uh, what you find as a Legendre transform is what enters the probability density, okay? And then this gen the general partition function would be the sum over all states of this quantity, right, of the exponential. I want to grab my coffee, but then you can't see the board anymore. That's the problem with tracking cameras. Maybe, yes, there we go. Any questions about this? Okay. So if I were to ask you at some time, I give you an ensemble defined by a set of constant extensive variables and a set of non-constant extensive variables, you should be able to write down what the probability density is, okay? You should be able to write down what the probability density is, what the partition function is. And then the next step is you should be able to write down what, how you calculate the thermodynamic properties, the thermodynamic averages from the partition function. So, Maybe I can spend a minute doing that. Okay, so in general, if I have a system for which the entropy functional is written as S over KB minus beta E and then Legendre transformed for a bunch of extensive variables. So I'll sum over I, Psi I, Xi. And so this is sort of, I'll call this LT. So this is the group of variables, right? This is the group of variables for which Xi fluctuates. So I, I Legendre transform with respect to all of them. And so remember this part is what goes into probability density. So what are the thermodynamic quantities? Let me first write down the partition function. Um, uh, 
because it's helpful to see that. Um, so the partition function is the sum over all states e to the whatever goes in this box, right? Which is the Legendre transform part, which is the sum over all states exponential minus beta e nu minus some i psi i nu x nu i, sorry. Too many indices. Psi is a control variable, so it has no dependence on microstate. Psi i, psi i nu, here we go. Um, one thing to guard you on, because books do it a little different. So to me, my sum over state, this, this contains, this sort of sums the whole phase space. Uh, let me explain what I mean with that. So sometimes uh, if you say have a grand canonical ensemble, sometimes uh, some books will split out the sum over states uh, as a, a sum over the number of particles because you have a grand canonical ensemble and then a sum over states for a given number of particles, right? Uh, I just find that confusing and I find that um, keeping a general formalism where this is basically all the accessible states of your phase space is just a lot easier to keep a general formalism. But you'll see occasionally in books it'll be, you know, if you have an isobaric ensemble, for example, where the volume can fluctuate, people will pull the volume fluctuation out and sum over that separately. Okay, so how do you get the average value of xj of this extensive quantity in general. Well, I hope that again, by now you've done a few problems and you've tried this, right? Um, these average values of extensive quantities, they're all, they are always derivatives of the log of the partition function, right? And the reason is that if you take a derivative of the partition function with respect to If you take a derivative of a part, the partition function with respect to xi, right, the conjugate, that will bring down this variable, right, before the exponential. If I take the derivative, this will pop out before the exponential. And so what I, what I will be summing is the, the quantity x nu times the probability, so I will get the average. So, So the average of xj will always be the derivative of the log of the partition function. And the reason you need the log of the partition function is because, you know, d log theta, right? That becomes, um, with respect to something, call it x, right? Will become one over theta d dx, right? And you want that because you wanna bring the theta down to normalize the probability. So it will be the, the derivative d log theta with respect to minus xi i, or in this case, xi j, because I've called it j. Okay, by now, you know, you're probably hope, utterly confused, right? But take this home, well, you are home, sorry. Um, and stare at this, right? This is trivially simple. And, and you should get to the point where you consider this trivially simple. If you can do the steps, right? If you understand what the partition function looks like, you should understand that this is trivial, right? Because this is, you know, this is equal to one over theta, d theta, d minus psi j, right? And when I take the derivative with respect to psi j, I, I lift out xj. And so what I'm getting is sum over states 
right? I get sum over states uh, of x, j, nu, right? That's what I'm lifting out when I take the derivative with respect to minus psi j of the exponential of the whole box thing, right? Divided by the partition function. The box thing is this whole thing here, right? The whole Hamiltonian. And so this is equal to some new x j new times the probability of that microstate. So this is equal to x average j. So do this like, do this like 10 times, right? If you need to do it 10 times to get it, then do it 10 times. Because otherwise these formulas look like a mess, right? They look hopelessly complicated, but they're really essentially super trivial, right? Can I say something? Everything about statistical mechanics, right? Taking derivatives is lifting things out of the right thing out of the partition function. It's always, I need to take the right derivative of the partition function that I bring the right thing out and average it. And by the way, this has, this has, um, this has similarities in quantum mechanics as well, where you lift things out of the, um, out of, you take derivatives of the Hamiltonian and so, but let's not go there. Okay. Oh, and by the way, now you see that this generalizes to the energy, right? Because what's the average energy? Well, the conjugate of the energy is beta. So I just take the, the logarithmic derivative, right? I take d log theta, d minus beta, right? And that we had proven many times before. So if I want the average of a fluctuating extensive quantity, I just take the logarithmic derivative with respect to its conjugate. Well, and a bit of minus sign. This always works, okay? Okay, let's do some examples and we're gonna rederive things that we all know already. So then we're sure we're right. Okay, let's see if this, this trickery works. Let's do microcanonical. Okay, so in this case, I have energy, volume, and n constant. So what do I have to Legendre transform? Well, nothing, right? I have to Legendre transform nothing, which means Entropy is the relevant thermodynamic potential, right? This is the thing that you maximize. There are no intensive variables I control, so I have no Legendre transform. So what is the box? The box that goes in the Hamiltonian. The box is empty, right? So it's zero. So that means what's the probability? The probability is e to the nothing, right? Zero divided by the partition function, which is the sum over states e to the zero, which means e to the zero is one. So that's one over omega, where omega is the, this here is the number of states. See, my trickery works, right? Okay. And, you know, and, and we can do canonical for the end time, right? You can do canonical, right? But we've done this now so many times, right? So if you do canonical, blah, 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 you would do psi, right? Is uh, entropy minus beta E, right? Where I'll, I'll do these uh, normalized by KB. So the probability density would be exponential minus beta E, right? Okay, I don't really have to write this down. You know this, right? We've done grand canonical already. What else can we do? Okay, let's do isobaric. We have never done isobaric. So where the volume can fluctuate.
let's do um, T P N. Right, so that's uh, an isothermal, isobaric ensemble. So not a volume can fluctuate. So my Legendre transform of the um, entropy, I have to uh, Legendre transform with respect to the energy. Mine is beta E minus psi V and psi is gonna be uh, like minus the pressure over KBT, right? Okay, so what's the probability of a state when the volume can fluctuate? It's the exponential of this Legendre transform piece, right? So minus beta energy of the state minus psi times the volume of the state. And I didn't write down on my notes what psi is, but we can figure this out, right? Psi probably is minus minus P over KBT, if I get it right. But let me check that. So divided by the partition function, and normally I use theta for the partition function, but because this is a well-known ensemble, People use big lambda often, like Greek lambda. You know, I think life is much simpler if everything is theta. Have you ever seen the movie, The Devil Wears Prada, which like um, she, she calls her assistant, Emily, whatever her assistant. It's a very good movie, at least the beginning part. Um, it's with Meryl Streep. Um, it's, you should watch it. It, it, it will make you chuckle about my nomenclature. Um, okay. So this hat, the lambda partition function is again, the sum over states, exponential minus beta E minus uh, psi V nu. Okay. So you have the, um, And then ask yourself, like, I'll let you do this. If you have the partition function, so let's say you have, uh, how would you get V? So the average V, how about you solve that, right? You have the partition function, how would you get V? Because V is now a fluctuating quantity. Okay. I think we've done enough of this. Let's do something else. So the last thing I wanna talk about is something very different, um, which is fluctuations, which is a very cool thing in StatMech. It's, um, I'm gonna unveil the tip of a magical iceberg well, no, the tip of some magical mountain. Um, and the mountain is pretty spectacular. You're only gonna get like a little, little uh, piece of it, which is fluctuation theory, but there's so much more where this came from and it's truly fabulous. So fluctuations in statistical mechanics play a particularly important role to get properties. Um, so it turns out when you, have fluctuating quantities like the energy or the volume or other extensive properties, um, they, they will give you property information. Uh, they will give you things that, are, that we think of as the second derivatives of thermodynamic functions, things like heat capacities, compressibilities, and so, um, which by itself is already remarkable, right? Um, and I'll come back to this. The fact that you can get out of fluctuations of something in equilibrium right? You can get a statement about how it responds to a perturbation from equilibrium. Um, but first, let me walk you through it. Um, so let me start with fluctuation of the energy, and then I'm going to generalize this. Um, so why are we interested in fluctuations, right? So remember that we showed um, later that sort of 
many quantities, if I, if I have an average value of X, right? So this is the average, so this, this axis is X, then uh, the probability to get other values is sort of is Gaussianly distributed. And if this quantity is extensive, then this Gaussian uh, remains a real width. If this quantity is normalized, then the Gaussian becomes delta function. Um, so let me first do the fluctuation of the energy. So um, I'm going to define the spread of the energy as sigma squared E, so sort of the, the Gaussian spread, is um, the average of E squared minus E squared, uh, E average squared. Um, and here notation can get a little messy, right? So this is, this here is the average of E squared. This is the average energy squared. And because sometimes it's a little hard to see where the bar is drawn, uh, we sometimes use other notation for averages, which uh, you can also use these kind of brackets for averages, right? So uh, sometimes it's clear to write it as E squared average. So this bracket also means average minus E average squared. Okay. So how would you calculate this? Well, one way is to do it explicitly. Um, you, you would just, you know, do that as a sum over the probability density the, or the states, the probability of a state, right, times the energy of that state squared, and then minus the average energy, which is some new P nu, E nu, and then you square that, right? So that would be a way to get the Gaussian spread. Uh, you can do this actually, it's a bit complicated. You know, you just plug in what P nu is and you turn the crank and have some more coffee. Um, but there's actually, um, whenever, you, whenever you wanna calculate fluctuations, there's sort of a standard uh, three line derivation that always works. So I wanted to give you that. And I didn't invent this. Um, this really comes out of Macquarie. So I'm gonna give it to you for the energy. And I apologize, it's sort of a bit um, given like a recipe, you know, it's the 10 step program, but it's really only three steps. to the answer. They're long steps though. Um, the first one is that um, you start with uh, the average quantity, the average of the extensive variable that you want to have the fluctuation for. Uh, you, you multiply that by the partition function. So I, I'll take the energy here, but this could be any X, right? Um, and then you write that out explicitly as a sum over states. Right, we're still good, right, with line one. Step two, which is the long one, is to take the derivative of this equation, so both sides, with respect to the conjugate of the fluctuating variable. And that's conjugate in the entropy notation, right? So if I'm looking at the fluctuation of the energy, the conjugate to that is beta. If I were to look at the fluctuation of some X, the conjugate of that would be what we call Xi, right? Okay, so last bit of math for today. Let's do that. So I'm gonna first take the left-hand side. I'm gonna take the derivative. So if I take D, D beta of the left-hand side, that's um, the E D beta times Q plus uh, E average times D Q D beta. And you know, Q is the partition function. We are now experts in taking derivatives of that. So this is, um, we state the D E D beta 
times Q. Why did I call it Q now and not theta? Can you handle that? Like it's Q now, okay? The partition function is Q, not theta. It's a partition function, okay? Like, okay. Um, okay, now I lost my thread. Um, oh yeah. So we now take plus E average times the derivative of Q with respect to beta. So that's sum over microstates. Uh, and if I take a derivative of partition function, that brings out a minus E nu of the exponential of minus beta E nu, right? Cool. Let's do the right hand side. So I take dd beta, and on the right hand side, I have um, the average energy. So when I take the derivative of that, there's only one beta there, that brings down, right? there's only one beta here, so that brings down another e nu. So this is gonna get where I'm going to get my square of the energy, right? So this is some nu of minus e nu squared exponential minus beta e nu. Ah. The light is coming. I will now divide both sides by Q, right? So this Q goes, um, well, that's the same as this one. And I want the Q here so I can get that into average energy and I get a Q here. So I'm starting to get things that are useful to me, right? Because what is this here? This is the average energy again, right? But it's minus, right? So this term here, this here is equal to the average energy squared with the minus sign in front, right? And this term here, This here is uh, the square, the average of the energy squared with a minus sign. And that means that if I put it all together, I find that the derivative of the average energy with respect to beta is minus the average of the energy squared minus the average energy squared. So it's minus the standard deviation squared. We should be proud. Okay, do you need to see more? I'm Vanna White in the Wheel of Fortune. Please look at the prize. Okay. Let me show you that this is super cool. If, unless you're really awake, you probably haven't quite soaked up the coolness yet. But this is so amazing because Okay, let me retake this on this board. Let me uh, take the, bring over the final result. Right. Final result that we got is that minus the E D beta is minus the standard deviation on the energy squared. Let's calculate, let's figure out what this actually is here the ED beta. I want to put that in terms of T. So I can use the chain rule on that, right? The ED beta is the average energy with respect to T times the TD beta, right? 
And what is the EDT? If I, I'm working here in a canonical ensemble, so I have no work, right? So because the volume is constant. So this is the heat capacity, right? This is CV. So this thing here, and then I have DT, D beta. You can do this math much better than I do. Uh, my neurons are way too old for that. This is minus KT squared times CV. So what does that mean? That means that CV is equal to the energy squared averaged minus the average energy squared divided by KBT squared. You know, Jen Yang, is your drum roll ready? I feel like we're missing a drum roll in the lectures. We really need to have drum roll music ready because this is the drum roll moment, right? Um, first, let me explain what everything is, right? So this is the fluctuation. First of all, this is the fluctuation of the extensive quantity. This energy is not normalized. Right? It's the energy of the whole system. It's not per atom or per mole or per unit cell, right? So what that means is this is also the extensive heat capacity. So normally, right, we list heat capacity as per mole or per centimeter cubed, whatever, but this is actually the total heat capacity of the system, right? Because it's one extensive quantity equal to another extensive quantity. Um, you know, this is an equation that would make me lose sleep because if you think about it deeply, what is CV? CV is the response of a system to a perturbation, right? CV is telling you, if I change the temperature, how much does the energy change? And what I'm telling you here is, I don't need to change the energy to even know that. If I look at the fluctuation of the energy in the isothermal ensemble, right? This is the fluctuation at constant temperature. It's giving me the answer. So what I've just proven to you is that how a system responds to a perturbation, and I'm making grand generalizations here, right? Because I've just proven it for the energy. But I've proved to you that in this case, how a system responds to a perturbation is actually embedded in its fluctuations. But, and this turns to be, is a much more general principle in physics, right? Uh, you can do this in quantum mechanics. You can show that if you know the wave functions of a system, you can do first order perturbation theory, showing that you can show exactly how the wave functions change when you apply a force or a perturbation of the potential, for example. So, so there is something general here, um, but I'm just gonna keep it to STATMEC for now. Um, I'm going to first generalize this for different extensive quantities, and then I'm going to give you a bit of philosophy, which I never do, but I lost a piece of my notes. Okay, um, there's another cool thing you can show here. Oh, what am I gonna do here? Is you can, you can see the relative size of the fluctuations here, which we've talked about before. It's an R, relative size of fluctuations. Okay, and the reason is, so I define this as sigma E squared. So the standard deviation sigma E is the square root of KB T squared times CV. So if I divide that, so if I normalize that by the energy, it's the square root of KB T squared over CV divided by the energy, average energy. So here I have two properties that go like N, the size of the system. So that means this goes like the square root of N divided by something that goes like N. So that means that uh, 
uh, this goes like one over the square root of n. So what that means is again, what we've seen before, while the standard deviation of the energy is a real thing, right? right? If I, this is the standard deviation of the energy, the total energy, that's a real thing. That doesn't go to zero, right? It's actually the square root of KBT squared times CV. But the standard deviation of the energy normalized by the energy, which is what you care more about, right? That actually does go to zero. So, so the normalized average thermodynamic quantities, they go to, they don't fluctuate, right? But the full extensive quantities in thermodynamics fluctuates. I feel I totally lost you on that. Okay. So, if you're taking notes on an iPad, you can do copy and paste this derivation and you can put in X everywhere. So I'm gonna make this X, this is X new, right? And then you're gonna find something in terms of fluctuations of X. Which I was gonna write down with gallantry, except now I have to, I'm held up by erasing the board. So what you will find if you do this derivation for an extensive quantity, you have that the derivative of the, the average X with respect to its conjugate Xi is the fluctuation the, of X squared. So that's X squared average minus X average squared. Okay, so let's see how useful this is by doing some other ensembles. So, okay, let me do a test. If I calculated the fluctuation of the volume, what property would I learn? How much would you pay for the fluctuation of the volume is really the question here, right? If I give you the fluctuation of the volume, what's the property that you would learn? I would learn, yeah, go ahead. Compressibility? Yeah, exactly. Because I would learn about how the derivative of volume with respect to its conjugate, and don't worry about all the KBTs, right, that are hanging around. So you would learn something about the derivative dv dp. So you would learn about compressibility. So let me show you what you would learn. Okay, so we'll take as extensive variable x is the volume, which means the conjugate is p in entropy notation p over kbt. I think I got that right the last time. Ooh -hoo. Okay, so what I get then is that if I plug in this formula, right, I get minus KBT times DV DP. Ah, it feels good to be back in thermal land, DV DP. Uh, is the fluctuation of the volume. So it's V squared average minus V average squared. And let me divide by volume here. So I'll put like a one over V here, right? Can you see that? That's a one over volume. So the minus one over V dV dP, that's the compressibility. And unfortunately, we call that beta, remember? Sorry. So beta T, the isothermal compressibility is the fluctuation of the volume squared minus V, the average volume squared over KBT times the volume. 
So if you were to track volume fluctuation in an isobaric ensemble, you would learn the compressibility. And, and this is how properties are actually calculated when people do statistical mechanics, how they, when they do simulations. When people do simulations in statistical with statistical mechanics, the way they get the properties is usually from the fluctuations. They don't actually apply pressure and see how the volume change. They just track the fluctuations. Um, okay, you can keep on going, right? And some of these are actually quite cool. Like, not that these are not cool, okay? But, you know, everybody's equal. Um, the extent, what if the extensive quantity is Q? What do I learn then? So if I work in a system where charge can fluctuate, so I'm open with respect to charge, So I'm going to learn something about something about this derivative, right? dQ, d voltage. But you know we're sort of running out of letters, right? Um, I can't call it v. Let's call it psi. So that's not electrical potential, right? So what am I going to learn about? What is this beast? This is related to capacitance, right? Right. So. What you would find is that dQ dV, so d psi, is the fluctuation of the charge squared minus the average charge. And I would have a kBT here, and I would have a minus sign. I think this is right. And then you would normalize by volume because you want the capacitance per unit volume. So the fluctuation of the charge would tell you about the volume, the, the capacitance, sorry. Sorry, lost one page of my notes, but I will get it for you. You don't think this is cool? Equilibrium information embeds the response to a perturbation. That's the, that's the big philosophical message here. It gets even better. And this is not outside of the realm of our course. This is just for your general education. Um, if you track the time correlations between the perturbations, so if you essentially, now instead of just tracking, let's do energy, right? If you just track like how energy at time differs from the average energy, if you track this correlation, you can actually learn kinetic coefficients. And this is what goes in general under what's called green Kubo relations. Now, this is a whole other ball of wax, right? Because um, when we use the ergodicity principle, we, we went away from dynamics, right? Remember we said, we don't wanna track a system in time. We're gonna track, we're just gonna average over its ensemble which is why we can only get these things that, are, that don't have time in them. But if you went back and you did statistical mechanics with dynamical equations, then you could actually calculate the time correlation. Like, you know, uh, at a given time, how far I am from the, from the average energy. And if you learn the decay of those fluctuations, it turns out you would have the kinetic coefficients. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if you have mass decay fluctuations, so if you track NT minus N average, that would give you a diffusion coefficient, right? Because that's a correlation of mass, so it would tell you how mass changes in time. 
and this is really a really beautiful piece of statistical mechanics. Um, we won't actually teach you this sadly enough and uh, the department still doesn't have a course on kinetics of materials. Um, but this would be the link between thermodynamics and kinetics that the fluctuations in a thermodynamic ensemble already embed all the first order kinetic information. So everything that is linear in perturbation theory um, where you basically say that fluxes are proportional to gradients of, of thermodynamic potentials is embedded um, in these equilibrium fluctuations. If this was all gobbledygook for you, that's okay. You can totally forget everything I said about green cue ball. On the other hand, if you're excited and if you're sort of into this stuff, you may want to read a little more about the green cue ball relations um, uh, at some point. So uh, any questions? Because this is all I had to say for this lecture.